This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Always, always good to see everybody on a Friday and especially today because we have two of my favorite people besides Gary joining us. Well, first is Amy Trask, who's the current, Amy, is your title CEO of um, Big Three? No, that would be Chris. My title is chairman of the board. But of course, chairman. as you know, from all of our hands on work, none of us care about titles. We work as a team. And Amy famously uh, was the princess of darkness for many <laughs> years at the uh, at the then Oakland Raiders, right? Uh, I was with the Raiders in Los Angeles. I joined once Al had already moved them to Los Angeles a number of years after that. And then, yes, I moved with the team up to Oakland when he chose to move it back. And I appreciate you using my nickname, which I will forever cherish. And I hope you're a little bit afraid. I am. I'm frightened. I'm always a little bit frightened. And our CEO called you yesterday, the conscience of the big three. So I love that. And then we're all, I do too. Yeah. We're also joined by uh, Dan, the uh, Dan, the lust for life. Who's uh, AKA Jimmy Neutron. Who's uh, Amy. You probably (laughs) may have seen some of his posting. He's uh, got a thing called conduct detrimental and is very heavy into the sports world. But first, Without much ado, I want to talk to Amy about a, was it an article that you posted yesterday, Amy? Uh, It was. I wrote an article for The Athletic, uh, and yes, I did share it on Twitter. Right, and uh, it ignited quite a uh, little firestorm. It really, it it did, And, and Mark, you know me well enough to know that I am not a hot take artist. I don't... I I don't have hot takes, but I I did share a strongly held view on the situation in Jacksonville. Yeah. Could you um, articulate that? Because it was so such an outlier for you, just because you're not a hot take person. But why don't you articulate uh, the thesis that you uh, posted? Well, thank you for both noticing and noting that it was out of character for me to uh, be quite as strong as I was or share that just didactic of you. Uh, Look, when you own a team, when you own any business, you have to determine if the person that you have brought in, you have hired to lead that business, you got to decide, do you trust that person's judgment? Do you believe that that person can effectively lead your team, your business, your organization? And what Urban Meyer chose to do by remaining behind when the team flew home after a loss was, in my mind, extremely poor judgment and a glaring lack of leadership. Now, I want to be very clear that what he chose to do in that bar or restaurant or whatever it was, that's between Urban and his wife. But his poor judgment and his glaring lack of leadership, that does become the issue, the problem, the decision or grounds for a decision for a business owner. Yeah, and the owner the owner came out, I guess, after you posted this. I didn't do a timeline, but I did see where he had said it was unacceptable or something along those lines. Um, and uh, But it doesn't look like they're going to take any further action. Uh, is that uh, Dan or Amy? Have you heard of them taking any further action against Urban Meyer? At this moment, no, you're right. Uh, He came out very quickly and condemned the action and said that Urban is going to have to build back trust in the locker room. And by the way, and then I'll turn it over to you, Dan, I don't know how he builds back that trust in the locker room. The point I made in the athletic piece was do as I say, not as I do, is not leadership. How do you now stand up in front of your organization and say, after a loss, we are now going to immediately turn to the next game and get ready? And by we, I don't mean me, I mean you. Or we are not going to do anything to call into question um, this organization. And by we, I don't mean me, I mean you. I mean, do as I say, not as I do, is not, in my mind, effective leadership or leadership at all. Yeah, so just just to add there, and, and Amy, I, I, I back you up on your point. Uh, I think from a, a legal standpoint, you know, the people are questioning you know, if there is cause here, right, if this is a, a pure violation of Urban Meyer's, what we call a, 
you know, a, a morals clause, which people will know, you know, I'm not sure exactly uh, where, where the line is, but it's kind of, you know, when you see it type deal. Um, and, and the question, I guess, uh, in maybe sports circles, right, uh, if uh, Urban Meyer potentially uh, has violated that clause, if the Jaguars want to let him go, give him a, a golden parachute, and maybe he goes off and signs with USC, uh, as there's been a lot of rumors, uh, you know, to go over uh, and go to, you know, one of, uh, and help repair one of college football royalties programs. But um, I guess that's the question, right? And I'm not missed maybe a Mr. Conspiracy theorist, but the question is whether Urban, you know, at this point wants the easy way out and would like the Jaguars to fire him and let him go and collect his 10 million or whatever it is under his contract. I think the reports are would be in that vicinity if they, if they allowed him to walk. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think that would be the easy way out for Urban Meyer, who's now 0-4. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of reports that he's lost the locker room in his handling of this. And, and not just of what happened on video. And Amy, to your point, you know, I, I imagine in an NFL circle, something like this is not so uncommon, right? But it is necessary. I, I heard, uh, I was listening to, uh, you know, another reporter. I think uh, Urban Meyer, you know, after that loss on Thursday night, he didn't fly home with the team, which is not really that normal. He didn't completely address these rumors head on. Uh, and I think the team was very uh, uneasy with his handling of it. And then the Khan family's, uh, you know, statement, uh, the owner of the team, you know, essentially said that Urban has to get back the, the respect of the locker room, the confidence of the team. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, it, seem, it seems like there are people on the inside of the organization that uh, have certainly lost the confidence in him. Uh, but that begs the question as to why they why they wouldn't pull the trigger. So maybe there's some financial reasons. Um, but but yeah, I, I certainly I'm, I'm hearing that that there was certainly discussion that uh, whether this violated his morals clause and whether he was going to be terminated. But obviously they came out on the other end of it. Okay, you said a whole bunch there, and I want to try to respond to as much as I can without forgetting anything. But before I do, I want to just say. Tip of the hat to the Potter Stewart reference of, you know it when you see it. I use that. I, I, I use Potter's. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you want to talk more? Well, I just said uh, that, that, that's what I'm here for. The good, uh, the good law school references. But, but ah. um, yes, I use that Potter Stewart. You know it when you see it reference when I talk about taunting, because, of course, the league is now enforcing taunting rules. And I always say Potter Stewart said it best. We know it when we see it. As to the points you made about Urban, you know, there's clearly the issue as to is money owed. And as you correctly noted, of course, it goes to what are the terms of the contract? Did he violate it? There has been discussion that he had permission from Trent Balky, the general manager. But the nuance in that is it is the understanding of many that Urban's position is more senior than that of Trent. And he has final say. So even if he said to Trent, hey, I'm going to stay or I'd like to stay or I'd not to, you know, I'd like to remain behind, you know, there's the issue that Trent may not have had the authority to tell him not to. So put that issue aside. The the clause in the contract that describes conduct and conduct detrimental is, of course, the key clause in determining if compensation is owed. I will note two things in response to what you said um, before I turn it back to you guys. One, Um, I'm not sure USC is interested in him anymore. After something like this, which gains national attention, UCLA, maybe uh, USC, I'm sorry, maybe (sighs) saying, nah, 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 we're not interested. Or they may not be interested for the moment until this quiets down. And as to your point about flying back with the team, I spent almost 30 years with an NFL team and I cannot recall one time a head right. coach did not fly home with us. And and to those who would say that nothing goes on on flights home, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. And a lot goes on on flights on the way home. Head coaches are yeah. visiting with every player. They are meeting with the trainers and medical staff. They are prepping for the next game. They are looking at video of the game they just played. So, yes, things go on on that plane. Yeah. And, and to your, to your point, you know, there, there's a lot of smoke going around on an urban Meyer and I, and I think you're right. I think USC would be crazy to, to touch him right now. Maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't, especially after that Thursday game when the Jaguars opened up to a big lead and then, and then blew it in a, in a winnable game. I'm not sure why, uh, you know, you're not, you're not flying back. And I, I heard the same thing that, that you did. And obviously you would know from your you know, firsthand experience, but I've, I've been told that that's never happened. So you, he might've lost the locker room even before that video came out. The update today, which, you know, you, you hate to see it, but uh, the uh, female individual involved in that video, uh, you know, her place of employment has been identified. 
She's, I guess, going through some type of emotional distress. Uh, her mother is speaking out on her behalf. So it's a really ugly situation. And I, I, don't, I don't really, I haven't seen anybody talk about this angle, but, um, you know, the, there's also potential, right? I, I hate to say it, but potential, right? Uh, some potential civil liability here if this girl wants to, you know, make, make this, uh, make a mess of the situation, which certainly won't make the story go away. But she's, you know, the reports are that she's going through some type of emotional distress now. Maybe there was some unwanted touching. I, you know, I, I don't, I hate to say it, but, you know, uh, in our, in the world that we live in, uh, it's, stranger things have happened. So I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of, of this story. And the more that the story continues, obviously, uh, I think it's going to uh, cast a, a lot of doubt on the future of Urban Meyer in the NFL and, and maybe his, his future coaching in general. Well, it certainly didn't strike me that there would be civil liability there. But as you well stated, you said it well, we live in a day and age where people are going to sue for anything. But I wanted to note as to the young woman who was involved in this matter, my understanding is that the company for which she works that is now doing an investigation does business with a company in which Urban is involved. So there's that layer as well. But again, what Urban did with his time remaining back from traveling home with the team was not my focus. My focus is simply on, in other words, my focus from the perspective of a team owner and whether or not Urban should remain with the team is, do I trust your judgment? Because this is just the latest incident in my view of poor judgment. And do I think you can lead this team? Yeah. And I, and I think that's fair. I mean, uh, you know, and we were talking uh, on, at least on our show, which Amy is coincidentally called conduct detrimental. Mark, Mark doesn't know why the show is called conduct detrimental, but I saw his eyes light up. Now he knows why it's called conduct. Detrimental. <laughs> well, I love uh, Mark show. I love everything Mark puts out. And I've always loved the fact that it's called conduct detrimental. And Mark, by the way, yes. if you ever decide to play fantasy football or anything like that, you should name your team conduct detrimental or some such thing. That would be a good fantasy football team name. Uh, well, Dan will Dan'll, uh, sue me for uh, infringement or something. <laughs> you want to hear something it. funny? I put out a poll and I said, what should my fantasy football team be called? And the listeners of this show, Reasonable Doubt, reached out and said that my team name needs to be called Reasonable Route. R -E -R -O <gasps> oh. oh. And, and by the way, there's another double entendre there. It could be Reasonable Route, R-O-U-T-E, as in the route a receiver runs, or it could be Reasonable Route, R-O-U-T, as if in you, if, if your team routes the other teams. I like it. I like wow. it. Gary, Gary had a good suggestion, too. He said a, a Brady violation. That should be the name of, of my team. Tom Tom Brady violation. Yeah, well, you had Brady oh. as your quarterback, so that's only reasonable. Um, right. Look, before we... Don't even start me. Don't even start yeah, me. Well, I was, uh, really? To, to, really? To loyal <laughs> listeners, they know I have two dogs named Brady and Jiglio, so and my son and I argue over which Brady the uh, dog is and, named after. And he is a magnificent quarterback, but you do understand I'm now having tuck rules flashbacks <laughs> Fair Amy, we're gonna let you go because we know you've got a hard out we really appreciate you coming on i know that anytime on a football weekend uh, you're you've got to deal with tv and the hards ins and outs and i love you and i'll call you back well, and i just want to let you know that it is absolutely my honor and privilege or as my mother would say um i'm tickled pink to join you on your show and i um, want to underscore how much i appreciate that you invited me to do so Thank you so much. Uh, Jimmy Neutron, don't go anywhere. I have a question for you. Oh, that's me. Okay, I yeah, won't go anywhere. Be you. I have a question. <laughs> I um, am not in the weeds like you are on the St. Louis lawsuit uh, where the city of St. Louis is suing um, the NFL. But did I see correctly that they started jury selection and now the NFL took uh, a writ to the appellate court to try to bar this from being a jury trial? Is that right? Um, they, they are not saying that it shouldn't be a jury trial, but they are saying that the jury pool from which they are trying to pool for our, or pick jurors from is inappropriate. So, yeah, Mark, this is the fascinating part about this case. If and, and we can get into the, the minutia or, or maybe the big picture of the case. But, uh, you know, long and short, plaintiffs are the city of St. Louis, the county of St. Louis the St. Louis Convention Center. And it's a case about the St. Louis Rams being plucked out of St. Louis and given to L.A., you know who probably shouldn't be on a jury? Uh, people from St. Louis. That seems a little bit unfair. Uh, and that's particularly what a, a St. Louis judge, not coincidentally, has decided was fair and, and what is going up on appeal to the Missouri uh, Appeals Courts and Supreme Court. So that's and uh, it in the it's in the state court. Is that correct? 
Correct. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure why why that would be the case, where there would be federal, it seem, seemingly there would be diversity and, and amount of controversy satisfied. Uh, I think, you know, they've got a wonderful federal court there. I've done a couple of cases in that courthouse. I and mean, besides being a beautiful court, they've got some very able jurists there. But in the state court, too, I guess once or twice I've been in there. Um, also magnificent. But I, it's interesting to me that uh, how the NFL, who's representing the NFL? What law firm? Do you know? Uh, I don't have it offhand. Uh, it's not a, I, I think it's a small, it's a, oh, but Gary, do you have it? I will in a moment. You guys keep going and I'll, uh, okay, I'll jump uh, in. Because it's interesting to me that this, that this has gone to um, this far to jury selection with the, um, the stakes here, because uh, it sure seems to me like they're, you know, I'm not in, the, like I said, the caveat, I'm not in the weeds. But from a 30,000 foot view, or even just a uh, high in the cheap seats, it sure seems like the exposure here is enormous. And to quote my buddy Adam, um, you know, the, the potential for home cooking is, uh, is, you know, written all over this thing, as you just mentioned. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my, my the very high level view of the case. And then uh, you'll, you'll see where uh, I like the home cooking reference. It's certainly relevant. And the NFL and I thought you guys had Amy on here because of her Raiders ties. There's actually a similar lawsuit, City of Oakland suing the Raiders. Uh, but we don't need to get into that. But uh, I, so yeah, and- Amy, we can talk. You know, the thing about Amy, she she's. You know, she's besides being a lawyer, besides being the princess of darkness, besides being chairman <laughs> of the board of the big three. I mean, she's got the world's greatest resume. And you can, and when I see her, I can just talk to her for hours. I mean, it's, it's, she's just she's incredible. So she's she's a very big presence on, on sports Twitter. So uh, it was great having her on, obviously. So here's here's essentially where the case breaks down. Uh, Gary and Mark, you, you guys will know this really well. In the late 1990s, there was a series of franchise moving. So the Cleveland Browns became the Baltimore Ravens and the Houston uh, Oilers became the Tennessee Titans. So these local markets were a little freaked out. Uh, and they said, the NFL said, you know what, let's put these relocation guidelines in place and it'll kind of create a, a, an exit strategy. So if the local market has these diligent efforts to save the team and they have good fan support, at least according to the bylaws, you're not really allowed to move the team. So what happened in uh, Houston? They got a replacement team. The Houston Texans became a a new franchise. What happened in Cleveland? They lost the Ravens, but yeah, they got the Browns back. So why are these lawsuits popping up? Because the NFL, you know, for the last, you know, uh, 20 years has not had any further expansion. So St. Louis lost a team. They're not getting an expansion team. They have a lawsuit. Oakland lost a team. They're not getting a new team. Now they have a lawsuit. So this case in St. Louis, the one in Oakland, which I'm, I'm not as familiar with, but that's mainly on antitrust grounds. Uh, the one over in St. Louis is not based on antitrust grounds. Reach of contract, the contract being these relocation guidelines that I mentioned, the diligent efforts and whatnot. St. Louis has said, you would made us jump through 20 hoops. We poured millions of dollars into the stadium. We gave you a billion dollar new stadium proposal and you just rejected it. And meanwhile, you were telling people the whole time that you were always planning to move to St. Louis so or to, to Los Angeles from St. Louis. So the question is, you know, there's a ground of unjust enrichment. There's a ground of fraud. You know, that why are you guys able to make millions of, or if not, you know, legitimately almost $10 billion from moving a franchise and putting it in Los Angeles? So you should be disgorged of those benefits, uh, you know, those billions of dollars. You shouldn't be able to lead us astray and lie to us and pretend you were uh, negotiating with us when it was truly in bad faith. When I know Gary likes this one. Back in 2012, they were interviewing coach uh, Jeff Fisher, who, uh, you know, had at some point helped the Houston Oilers become the Tennessee Titans. So he had experience moving a franchise. So in his interview, that came up that, hey, we might want to hire you because you know how to move a team. Uh, And they said, basically, yeah, the team's going to be in Los Angeles while you're the coach here. So that was in 2012. While these negotiations are occurring between 2012 and 2015, 2016, uh, there were town hall hearings held. So St. Louis is this really aggrieved party here. And they say, we lost our team, but you lied to us for three years. And there's a price to that. And because of the value of NFL teams, that price tag is in the billions with punitive damages. You know, I I think they're really alleging number close to $10 billion, which is the net worth of of the owner of the now Los Angeles Rams. Wow. Well, uh, 
Dan, it's always great to have you on. We, we And we always run out of time. We're actually over our allotted best 15 minutes in the universe, if you can believe it. Right, Gary? Absolutely. We're going to be uh, probably over our best 20 minutes in the universe by the time I stop talking. <laughs> but Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I was looking for that law firm. It is is not readily available, so I'm, I'm sure I can find it before our next episode, but uh, we'll skip it for today. Okay. Always a pleasure, guys. Listen, I trimmed about two inches off the hair for both of you. See, I'm letting yeah, mine yeah. grow to try to catch up to you. I'm, I'm going to upstage you one of these days. Okay, Lucas Kim still got better hair. <laughs> that's true. Uh, you know what? <laughs> that's fair. I give up. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Talk Thanks, guys. You. Have a good weekend. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. Stay tuned for more bonus episodes coming soon.